Um, I was asked to talk about CRT uh, indications and challenges. Feel free to stop me any moment during this um, presentation if you have any questions or want to discuss. Um, so we'll start with a case, and that did not work. There we go. Um, so here's a clinical scenario, 75-year-old male with a prior out-of-hospital arrest. And if there's a way that I could minimize myself so I don't see, I can't see my slides. How do I hide? All right. All right. Uh, prior out of hospital arrest, I uh, had a history of a dual chamber ICD put in uh, 2018, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, COPD, uh, diabetes, has preserved LV cystolic function um, as of in 2018 and then progressively developed complete heart block and became pacemaker dependent. Uh, he developed heart failure that was noted late last year uh, with pretty significant um, NYHA class two and three symptoms. He had an echocardiogram that showed an LVEF of 30, 35%. He underwent left heart cath again that showed um, no significant coronary artery disease. Um, so this is his EKG. Um, presenting EKG, and he is completely, um, so the rhythm is A-sensed and uh, RV paced. So he was referred for a CRT, um, and after CRT, um, this is the A-sensed and biventricular paced rhythm. So we'll talk about um, some of the indications of CRT, what kind of patients are selected for CRT, and what are some of the um, technical uh, challenges um, that we may encounter. So the basis of CRT, I think about um, in, the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, it was really established that RV only pacing can be quite deleterious. Um, that was really formally shown by the David trial in 2002. Uh, and then there were a few earlier trials that looked at biventricular pacing. Um, there's the multi-site simulation in cardiomyopathy studies and muscular studies that looked at 67 patients in a, with a single-blinded crossover study. Uh, they were um, subjected to 12 weeks of biometricular pacing uh, versus a back of pacing BVI-40, and then after 12 weeks, they switched. Um, and what they saw, uh, or actually the, the patient selection criteria for the study was a reduced LV systolic function with a mean ejection fraction of 23%, um, heart failure class three, uh, LV EBD of greater than 60 millimeters, and a QRS duration of greater than 100 milliseconds. They saw that CRT was associated with improved six minute walk distance, people to consumption, and quality of life scores. Um, as opposed to VVI 40 backup pacing. It was also the multi center in strength randomized clinical evaluation study, Miracle, in 2002. This randomized about 400 patients to CRT versus no CRT. Um, and the characteristics of these patients included a QRS duration of greater than 130 milliseconds, also LV systolic dysfunction, uh, less than 35% with a mean of 22%. Um, and then the LVEGD greater than 55 millimeters and um, heart failure uh, class three or ambulatory class four. And what they saw was that CRT was associated with improved functional class, increased six minute walk uh, time and peak VO2, and also improved quality of life scores. Um, so, what is the basis for that? Um, so, it's been uh, shown previously that CRT increases contractility without an increase in energy expenditure. Um, and this was a, a, a small study that looked at patients. They underwent uh, invasive cardiac cath um, and they got um, either LV pacing uh, or uh, intravenous debutamine. And what they saw was that with um, um, debutamine, if you were to uh, use debutamine, you see that there is increase in contractility as demonstrated by DPDT uh, max, but at the same time, there was an increase in um, MVO2. Um, so that means that there's an increase in energy utilization uh, when you um, have an increase in contractility. So that's at the expense of energy expenditure. But when they did LV pacing um, in, in these patients, what they saw was that not only was there 
no increase in MVO2, it's actually maybe even a small decrease in MVO2. So uh, bottom line is that CRT seems to enhance contract work here without using the extra energy from myocardium. There's also observational data um, and the studies have shown that CRT can reduce functional mitral regurgitation. Um, this is a um, image just taken from the study. This shows three-dimensional reconstruction of the tending of the volume of the closing area in the systole. And you can see pre-CRT and post-CRT, there is um, a smaller volume of regurgitant um, MR I believe the closing area also kind of decreased here post CRT. Um, the mechanism for why that occurs um, was uh, explored in uh, um, the study where they um, looked at pre and post CD uh, and they looked at continuous wave Doppler. Um, and what they saw was that in patients pre CRT, um, there was uh, increased uh, significance of MR um, and they measured. They calculated a value called the, pre, uh, the closing uh, pressure ratio, and the uh, lower that ratio, um, the um, seems like that the the less the closing pressure there is on the the mitral valve. Um, and when you restore electrical synchronization, the more even the closing pressure there is um, on the mitral valve, um, and, and that uh, led to reduction in functional mitral regurgitation. This on the left here is a model they use um, with uh, pacing and non-pacing, using pacing as a, um, a demonstration of um, electrical dyssynchrony. And what you can appreciate is the contour and the density of the um, MR recursion jet is it's slightly more significant than the pace versus the non-paced. So there were additional clinical trials uh, in the 2000s that uh, supported um, cardiac resynchronization therapy. Um, there was a companion trial in 2004 that was a comparison of medical therapy, pacing and defibrillation in heart failure. Um, this is a fairly large study looking at about 1,500 patients randomized uh, to optical um, pharmacologic therapy and or CRT plus drug therapy and uh, CRTD blood test therapy. Um, and the patient characteristics included uh, those who had heart failure hospitalization in the past year, uh, and I NYHA class of three or four symptoms, uh, QRS with a greater or equal to 120 milliseconds, a PR interval uh, of greater than 150 milliseconds, and LV uh, atrial fraction less than 35%. And the um, result, and the major result was that they found that CRT, whether it's pacing or ICD, was associated with reduction in a composite of all cause mortality or all cause hospitalization. Um, this was followed um, by the CARE HF study, this is cardiac resynchronization in heart failure. Um, this shows that, uh, also this randomized um, about 800 patients to CRT versus no CRT with the characteristics of injection fraction, again, less than equal to 35%. Um, this was more severe uh, cardiac desynchrony with a median QRS value of 160 uh, milliseconds in duration. And all these patients were in sinus with them with class three or four heart failure. And what they found was that CRT was associated with a reduction in the primary endpoint of all cause mortality and hospitalization for major cardiovascular events. So these are the um, results from the, the companion study um, showing that um, for the primary endpoint, um, uh, the um, pacemaker um, defibrillator um, or defibrillator versus pharmacologic therapy, um, that, that was, um, there was a, a benefit in survival uh, with CRG. Um, and this uh, was carried out as well as the secondary endpoint. And again, uh, we compare whether it's pacemaker or um, defibrillator, so the top line versus um, CRTP, um, which is this gray line in the middle. Uh, either one of those is, is, has a positive outcome, uh, more positive outcome relative to pharmacologic therapy alone. Um, and this down here is death from hospitalization or death from or hospitalization for only cardiovascular causes. And then down here is death from or hospitalization from heart failure. And again, all of these suggest that CRT, whether it's CRTP or CRTD, have improved um, event pre survival compared to um, optical um, pharmacologic therapy. Uh, 
this is from um, KRHF um, that um, says the, uh, the same thing in terms of that there is a benefit of cardiac desynchronization in patients with heart failure um, when they are randomized to CRT or no CRT. Um, on the left here, this is um, um, patients free of death from any cause or on-point hospitalization for major cardiovascular events. And then on the right here is um, the um, patients are free of death from so many causes well. And again, either one of these, you can see that there is a, a benefit of CRT over optical medical therapy. Additional trials um, supporting CRT, there was the um, MADA CRT, this is the multi-center automatic defibrillator implantation trial with CR, uh, cardiac desynchronization therapy. This um, took about 1,800 patients that randomized to either CRT-D or ICD alone, with the latter, the ICD alone, with um, minimizing pacing, um, so avoiding RV pacing as much as possible. And what they showed, um, well, first the characteristics of these patients were that they had injection fraction less than to the 30%, the QR duration greater than 130 milliseconds, and NYHA class one or two symptoms. So these are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic patients. Um, and initially in 2009, when it was published, uh, it showed that CRTD was associated with a reduction in the primary endpoint of CHS events or mortality, and an improvement in LV ejection fraction and left ventricular volumes. Um, and this, so the, this part of the improvement in left ventricular volume was shown in the subgroup of the study. In 2014, the long-term results were published and it showed that, um, that this benefit was really limited to patients who had a left on the branch block. In 2013, there was a block HF trial, which randomized about 691 patients to either RV or BIV pacing. Um, BIV was either CRTT or CRTD. Uh, this, uh, these patients all had either a class one or a two, two a um, ventricular pacing indication. Uh, their heart failure symptoms were quite variable from class one to class three, and they had an LVEF of less or equal to just 50% with a mean of 40%. There were exclusions here that are notable, which included any prior CIED, so not an upgrade. Um, there is no prior indication, so no alternative indication rather for CRT. Um, no valvular disease uh, with indication for repair replacement, uh, no acetylene, no QMI, et cetera. And what they um, uh, noticed was that BIV pacing was associated with reduction in composite primary outcome of death, urgent heart failure care requiring IV therapy, and adverse left ventricular remodeling. And BIV pacing, there was a trend towards decreased mortality. So this is that is blockage up. Um, so this is the MADIS CRT um, data that was published in 2009. Um, so on the left is the, the primary endpoint, probability survival uh, free of heart failure. And you see that the CRT ICD arm um, was um, significantly um, superior to ICD only. But this was at four-year follow-up. Um, and um, Again, a four-year follow-up within a subgroup of these patients, um, what they saw was that the LV ejection fraction had improved, um, and then the um, LV and systolic volume um, change was higher um, from baseline compared to the ICD in this group. The, um, um, uh, this actually is um, block HF uh, data looking at uh, biventricular pacing versus RV only pacing. Again, these are in patients who have an LVEF of less than 50% uh, with a high requirement or indication rather for RV pacing and a high percentage of RV pacing. And what they saw was that BIV pacing was superior on the primary outcome. And then also a uh, clinical component of the primary outcome was also um, superior compared to RV only pacing. Uh, this is um, data from the uh, MADIS DRT um, long-term follow-up um, that was published in 2014 that shows that in um, patients uh, with a uh, left on the branch block, there is um, a, a benefit of CRTD 
um, in terms of reducing mortality compared with ICD alone. This is that it's just a big blown up of this because the, the axis is um, different. And then um, when you look at patients that didn't have a left monogram plus, these were right monogram plus or IVCD patients, you didn't really see that separation at long-term follow-up anymore. Uh, there is a trial, um, uh, kind of a larger equivalent of um, block HF, a biopace trial. Uh, um, this is uh, preliminary data were, were presented at uh, ESC. Um, this randomized, um, or this took the initial cohort was 1,800 patients at normal um, LV function and um, subjected them to either by the or pacing. They had an indication for, for, for pacing. And what they saw, um, at, at least um, preliminarily, that was published in 2014, that it was a trend of 5 e pacing um, leading to an improvement in event free rate um, over um, RV pacing alone. But, but this wasn't really statistically significant. And at this time point, um, actually, there was no separation. And later, there became a separation. And this was uh, at the time when, the, when these preliminary results were published. Uh, I think the trial ended enrollment um, last year, and I haven't heard about any other results coming from the trial. So if anyone has any other information on it, I'll be very curious to know. So talking about the guidelines um, for what to do uh, with patients. So in patients that have heart failure with an LV gesture fraction of less than or equal to 35%, uh, we can look at the guidelines across the different major international societies. Um, so this is the ESC Heart Failure Guidelines, ESC Heart Rhythm Association Guidelines, and this is the ACC AHAHRS Guidelines, which are um, fairly older uh, Canadian guidelines, Australian guidelines. And what you can see is that across the board, there's slight variation, but not too much variation between um, the different, um, different societies. Um, one thing, um, so going, kind of going across this, so, so everybody who has a left bundle so the QRS duration of greater or equal to 100, 150 milliseconds. And as long as they're symptomatic, so they're not class one, they have a class one indication that looks like for CIG. Um, if the QRS duration is not as well as 150 milliseconds, but greater than 130 milliseconds, um, this actually, um, before these guidelines were updated, um, the European guidelines actually gave this a class one indication. Um, when the European guidelines came out just uh, this year, that was changed. So now they're actually more consistent, so at least with respect to between Europe and, and here, um, the guidelines for left on the branch block in patients with heart failure and the QRS duration of 130 to 149 milliseconds, the recommendation of the CRT is a 2A indication. And then for folks um, that have, um, uh, a narrow left on the bridge block with a QRS duration between 120 and 129 milliseconds, there's, I think, the greatest variation in terms of what the guidelines are recommending. And what about for non left bundle branch block um, patients? Um, here, for non left bundle branch block patients, um, in general, they um, don't respond as well to CRT um, therapy as, as patients with left bundle branch block. And that is um, also reflected um, in, in these guidelines. Um, so if, uh, if the QRS width is still wide, though, greater than 150 milliseconds, um, usually it is a two-way indication um, if they have uh, significant heart failure symptoms. Um, here, it's a 2B indication based on ACC, AHA, HRS, these are the older guidelines. Uh, if they're um, in my HA functional class of only two, that's a 2B indication. Um, and the evidence uh, becomes uh, weaker um, if the um, patient has a slightly narrower, not left on the branch block. Um, and you can see that's the passage here. And um, really what's important is that they have a um, non left on the branch block and their QRS is less than 130 milliseconds really is actually not indicated for CIT. The, the expectation is that they will not respond as well to um, CRT. Um, there are some less conventional indications for CRT, and not all the guidelines uh, from the major international societies have really commented on this. Um, but here, um, 
uh, here are some of the, the societies, again, Europeans and the ACGHAHRS. So looking at atrial fibrillation and heart failure, uh, this, um, uh, at least when at the time of um, the publication of this graphic, it was a 2A indication. Um, and based on the, the more recent 2021 guidelines from the FD, this has now become a class one indication, actually. If you have a patient who have expected high ventricular pacing and the percentage of um, ventri high ventricular pacing also kind of varies between the different international societies, but if you do have that and you have reduced LV ejection fraction with symptomatic heart failure, um, the ACCHA HRS guidelines in 2013 is 02A. And then again, based on the most recent EFT 2021 guidelines, it's not a class one indication for uh, CRT pacing. Um, what if you have an existing device? Um, and at what point should you consider um, changing it to um, CRT? And the SE um, Heart Failure Association guidelines in 2016 recommended this is a class 2B uh, indication. And then the, um, the Heart Rhythm Association um, from um, 2013 um, gives it actually a class 1 indication. Um, and this is limited to um, MYHA class 3 or M3 class 4 patients with a high degree of RV pacing. Again, this is not the same as what we're used to. Um, and then it's changed to class 2A recommendation in 2021 guidelines um, from class 1. So actually, it's kind of downgraded. Uh, the ACCHA and HRS guidelines from 2013 um, show that this, uh, or recommended that this um, uh, be a class 2A indication of um, changing an existing CIDD to CRT in patients who have a LV ejection fraction less or equal to 35% who are undergoing device. Um, generator replacement anyway, and their definition of um, what high burden on the will be is greater than 40%. So this is a summary of the changes um, from the ESC guidelines, uh, what uh, happened between 2013 and 2021 that is uh, limited to CRT. Um, this was published um, recently, and um, again, just to, to reiterate, so for patients, who have received um, a conventional pacemaker or ICD, who then subsequently developed symptomatic heart failure with an LVEF less or equal to 35% despite obstacle medical therapy, and then they have a high proportion of RV pacing, um, they should be upgraded to CRT. But this indication is now a true indication as opposed to a class indication. And CRT rather than RV pacing is recommended to patients with heart failure with reduced EF less than 40%. This is regardless of an IHA class um, uh, symptoms, as long as they have an indication for ventricular pacing with high gravity loss. Um, and this in includes both patients with sinus rhythm and the mode seven. And this is now a class one indication. So it seems like if you have heart failure and you need uh, pacing for high gravity block, um, you should consider CRT based on the most recent ESC guidelines. And then CRT should be considered for symptomatic patients for heart failure in sinus rhythm with an LVEF less or equal to 35%, and the QRS duration of 130 to 145, excuse me, 149 milliseconds, and left on the branch block QRS morphology by optimal medical therapy to improve symptoms and to reduce movement mortality. And this has been um, downgraded from a class one to a class two A indication. Um, and then the, the SD guidance also commented on what to do with symptomatic ACID patients with uncontrolled heart rate, uh, who are specifically candidates for AV nodal ablation. Um, and they um, recommend uh, this uh, be a class one indication of CRT in these patients who have heart failure. Um, so I'm not gonna go over this again. This is just again, the summary of um, the highlights from the SC 2021 guidelines. So who should not get a CRT? Because um, I think the, the most important thing is to recognize who probably will not benefit. And these are um, patients with a NYHA class one or two symptoms with a non left on the branch block with a QRS duration less than 150 milliseconds. On um, patients whose comorbidities and or frailty limit survival with dysfunctional capacity less than one year, these are also patients that should not probably get a CRT. Um, so this is a question um, from the um, core concept um, board review. So if you have a 68 year old man who had a bioventricular ICD implanted one month ago, he comes back today after no, they, no improvement in heart failure symptoms. And his device interrogation um, 
shows 99% LV pacing with a uh, VV LV to RV offset of zero. Um, and thresholds are, are good. Um, and this is what his, um, um, what his um, EKG looks like when it's by pace, RV pace versus LV pace. Um, what, what do you think should be done? Or do the fellows present? Any um, thoughts on it's, what should be done? It looks like his, um, So the right side is the LV pace. This is LV pacing. Okay, and then RV, okay. This is RV and this is by V. Right now with an offset of zero. Offset of zero, okay. So yeah. I think uh, perhaps, so there's no Q waves in, in lead one. There is a positive, there's, there is an R wave in V1 and you know, the L, and then there it, the other thing to note is that there's a long stem to QRS on the LV. So um, perhaps the offset on the LV should be changed to minus 30 and, and see what the, uh, if you can get a, a, a little bit of Q wave in lead one. Yes, yes, so that's, um, that's the right observation. So there's a long stem to QRS depolarization when you pace LV only. Um, and then during by V with um, zero offsets, um, there, I mean, a V1 is positive, but you can see uh, lead one and AVL, your left side lead, um, uh, they have no negative deflection. Um, so that's another indication that um, biventricular pacing during this um, setting for biventricular pacing, LV activation is, is not ideal. Um, so so that's, that is one way to correct this is to pace the LV first and, and change that also. So that's great. Um, so looking at um, LV positioning, LV lead positioning. Um, so this is one of the things um, in addition to programming that can really vastly impact the usability and effectiveness of CRT is, is where the LV lead is. Um, so this is RAO view, this is the RAO view. And you can see um, RAO, RAO view gives you an idea of how deep within the ventricle the, the CS lead is, whether it's basal, mid, or apical. And then the LAO view gives an idea whether it's anterior, lateral, or posterior. Um, and um, from, um, this is not a CRT data, but what they saw is depending on the different positions of the uh, CS or left ventricular pacing lead, uh, there was really no difference between anterior, um, posterior, and lateral positioning. But there was, there was a difference between apical and non apical um, pacing, where apical lead position, the CS lead was associated with a um, worse outcome compared to non apical. Uh, some other challenges um, that one might encounter during CS lead um, um, uh, 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 or attempting to um, change a device from an existing device to a CRT, so CRT upgrade, is a play with stenosis. Um, so here you have um, stenosis of the plamian vein, um, and you uh, this is an example of doing venoplasty essentially with a balloon to get over that stenosis and doing um, um, the um, uh, balloon uh, inflation um, from distal to proximal um, to get over that and then upsizing the balloon to a bigger balloon and eventually um, be able to access um, with, with the CS and doing your CS venogram. Um, here's another example um, of the Pleiadian stenosis uh, that is more um, proximal um, to the your actual site. And this is just a video. Um, you can see that there's a lot of collateral here. Um, this person had two fires, so a dual coil RV lead um, and then uh, probably an RA lead. And there is a complete occlusion um, of the Pleiadian on the left side here. Um, and uh, this is so the, uh, a screenshot of, again, venoplasty with a balloon um, going across that stenosis. Um, and the approach here is as long as you can get a wire down there, um, and you should be able to venoplasty. And usually they have fairly, fairly good outcomes. 
Um, some other things you might encounter during CS lead insertion is uh, difficulty advancing the lead, uh, especially if the takeoff of one of the branches to the CS is an acute angle or very odd angle, or has a high degree of torch velocity. Uh, you certainly use, um, in addition to the, um, uh, the initial delivery system, you can have an inner guiding sheet uh, with different um, conformations that can give you better stability as you advance um, the lead. Um, and for instance, here, there's a, if there's torch velocity here, another option is to advance the inner um, guiding sheet completely within to the, this uh, osteum to straighten out any kind of torch velocity. Um, this, um, there are some additional um, techniques that one can use, including um, doing what's called a buddy wire technique. So having two wires um, going forward, one as a rail um, and, and one um, through which you advance um, the CS lead. And of course, are different um, shapes to the CS lead across the different um, uh, manufacturers that can also help depending on the size and the torch velocity of your target branch. In general, um, it, it seems that the advice that I've gotten is that the, that the better you understand kind of the anatomy of the, the CS branching, the, the more relatively um, um, straightforward you're going to have um, in terms of being able to identify which tool that you need and which um, type of lead uh, would be best suited for it. Um, so taking um, multiple venograms um, in different views um, is, um, is going to be really helpful for you. Uh, so here's an example of that. So here um, is um, in this view, uh, in more aerial, you can see that there is in this um, balloon occluded CS venogram that there are two branches coming off of the main CS. Um, but when you change to an, an aerial view, you can see that the initial takeoff uh, on this more um, proximal branch is, is really quite acute and you know, diving downward. And you really can appreciate that in, in this aerial view. Um, so that's just more of the same. Um, and uh, so here, this branch was actually, the, the target of this branch was actually the upper branch. Um, and, and here, um, uh, I think there was, um, I attempted to target down this, this more acute branch using um, different types of subselecting tools. And that angle uh, was too, too um, hyper acute. Um, so I think it depends on how, uh, what kind of tools you have available. So also being aware of that before you start the procedure, uh, I think would be also helpful. Uh, as you advance it. And this is the, the final chest x ray for um, one of the CSV positions. Um, and you can see that this is a posterior lateral position. And the more separation you have from this and, and the RV lead, um, um, that can also improve um, um, the uh, response to CRT. Um, so here is again, this is a buddy wire technique um, shown here, two wires going down. And one one of the leads comes out one of the wire system to do in the rail. Um, there's also you might encounter a right sided um, implant, which uh, there is one on schedule for tomorrow, uh, which the CS um, engagement is typically um, more challenging with right sided um, uh, implants. Uh, and also, uh, one of the things is that um, uh, that people have noticed is that if you um, have the delivery sheet system, if it's coming down kind of on the lateral, um, uh, if you're being a cava as far right as possible, that can give you uh, more stability and be engaging to the CS. Um, and very, even more rarely, you'll have what's called persistent left superior vena cava. And um, you will notice that when you um, get access and your wire is not crossing the midline, here's your wire right here. Um, here, what you see is that it's actually a very, when you do a venogram, it's a very large CS osteum um, because all this is still part of the left, persistent left superior vena cava. Uh, it still can be done to deploy a CRT, a CS lead through this kind of anatomy, um, but um, recognizing that this, this can happen um, uh, will, will be important um, in, when you um, see it. Um, so just 
very fundamentally um, looking at um, how do you know that you have a decent position um, of your CS lead. Um, so what is the formal definition of a left on the branch plot? Because these are the patients that seem to benefit the, the most out of having a um, um, five ventricular pacing. So the formal definition is that the QR duration is greater than 120 milliseconds. And V1 should have either a QS uh, or a small R wave with a large S wave. And BB6 should have a, a Nash R wave or no Q wave. Um, and this is sometimes called loss of a septal Q wave um, because um, normally um, septal visualization is left to right. And when you have a left bottom branch block, um, you lose that power. Um, so, what are the EKG features of biventricular pacing? How do you recognize it? So, you, wish that you should expect that there would be a change in axis. Uh, from normal or left axis deviation towards more right um, uh, facing axis. Um, again, you would expect um, restoration of septal depolarization, so left to right. Um, and, and to um, see that, you would expect that there's a, a R, um, originally what was an R wave and one the AVL, uh, but there will be a more negative deflection now. So you have a QR uh, or a QS in, in the left side of the one the AVL. Um, uh, with the um, septal activation restored, uh, left to right, um, your septal R wave will return. So instead of having a QS in V1, you should have more of a positive flushing in V1 uh, with a small R, um, a big S, or a big R, and a big S, RS, which is an R wave. And then again, the septal Q wave, um, this is in the lateral leads, V6, V5, V6, that should also return. Um, you don't see all these patterns, obviously, but these are clues that you that would be helpful to identify that there is um, um, biventricular pacing with activation of the left ventricle. And then depolarization, um, if the LV is um, activated first, because the LV, the RV is the more anterior structure, if you restored um, LV depolarization first, then the depolarization should be closer to anterior. Um, and you should see that in your anterior leads, V1, V2, V3, that there should be, uh, instead of, uh, a, more of a negative deflection, there should be more of a positive deflection. Positive forces go from um, posterior to anterior. Um, so this is um, an example of um, BIV uh, EKG. Um, anyone want to just summarize some of the characteristics of this EKG? Um, so, in this ECG, you have um, your V1 has an R wave. It doesn't have a, uh, any Q waves. It's just a positive R wave. Lead one, though, is um, negative, which, um, I mean, it was expected that it should be a po like an, an, a positive vector, not a negative one. Um, and then... Looking at the other leads, um, the sept so the septal activation again. I don't. Um, yeah, you know, just have a single R. I just, I don't see a Q wave there, right? I don't see anything. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, you think. And then regarding posterior to anterior, uh, V two is positive um so um am i like is, is uh, julie is this where you're asking like to comment on like septal activation lv before rv and posterior to anterior or yeah yeah i think um uh, I just wanted um, to point out that um, everything you said is, is right, that the, the forces, if you think about how the ventricle is activated, that now the axis is it's, um, going towards um, the right, so away from the left. And um, there are slightly, you know, um, it's, it's more positive in, in the anterior leads, V1, V2, and V3. Um, so it's going towards the, the anterior side from the posterior side. and then. The septal activation. So again, V1, you have um, it, this kind of R wave in V1. So um, in the V6, um, it really don't quite see, but, but maybe there is a little deflection, the initial Q wave in V6, 
these are all things that I suggest that the step activations in the store from left to right. Um, whereas previously in a less bundle branch block, we would expect that not to be the case. Okay, so that um, so I'm not gonna go over that. It's just just um, what was on this. So that's actually all I have um, for this. Is there any have any questions or want to discuss anything? One thing I didn't go into and I haven't personally done is there's a concept of LV only casing. Uh, LV only casing is um, where um, you either um, only implant a CS lead and, and no RV lead, uh, or you know you implant a BIV device and you turn off the RV lead and just only casing the LV lead. Has anyone um, had any experience with that? There's some evidence that that is. Um, is useful in in properly selected patients. I've had some patients that I had, I've had one non-responder patient that we did LV only casing as you describe, and that was useful um, in that patient, um, even though I think it's really odd because the QRS is so bizarre when, with LV only casing. What I think is more, um, common right now with our concept of LVL only pacing is, is in patients who do not have complete heart block where they're the, um, to reduce the drain on the battery, there is sensing from the RV and timed synchronized LV pacing so that uh, patients just aren't by V pace, but the system is using RV right bundle conduction um, for the right ventricle, if that makes sense. Um, a lot of devices have this capability now, um, and they're often they often kind of call it LV only pacing. Only it's not LV only pacing the way that Julie was just describing. If that makes sense. Sure. We had a very similar case last week. Um, it was actually a patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy. He was referred initially for uh, evaluation for ICD CRT. He did have a left bundle, but he was class one at the time. And uh, after discussing both options with him, we actually went with a SICD. So we didn't do by V from the get go because he was class one. And he was doing fine. And then after three years, he started developing a little bit more symptoms, more subtle. So we decided to upgrade him. And with the new Boston device that he got, uh, there was the option of this right ventricular synchronized pacing, I suppose, is that that's the right way to do it, but they call it LV only pacing. But the optimization algorithm actually chose that option for him. And uh, it also ended up being the narrowest QRS that we got. So when, when patients are programmed LV only, or they only have a CS lead in some of these studies, you know, we all know that the CS lead has a, um, a higher probability of having um, increased threshold um, over time. Um, and some of the you know, uh, studies report as high as 30 to 40%. How, how do you address that? And how does that go into your decision making when the algorithm says it would suggest that you know go LV only pacing? Sorry, Julie, I, I don't think I caught the question. I'm, I'm walking in. Uh, no, I was just wondering. So when the algorithm suggests that you do LV only pacing. And suppose somebody is dependent. Um, the, the patient, um, so in these studies that look at LV only patient, they report sometimes as high as 30 to 40% um, the need to readjust because of uh, increased threshold. H how do you counter that? Um, I've never seen the device choose LV only pacing in these sort of configurations when there's no RV sensing. So I have not experienced that option.
Uh, I see your point, though. Uh, I think you might have to just sacrifice battery, give wide margins, and watch closely. Okay. One of the questions that I had was <clears throat> the performance of pure QR restoration versus these other markers of um, appropriate um, synchronization, like uh, a V1 R wave or a lead one ABL Q wave. So I, I don't know the data. I think the data are really hard. There's no, um, I've never seen a direct comparison, even though that would be such a nice study to do to see what markers really are most associated with um, uh, with, you know, a good uh, physiologic response to bi pacing. Um, it's a great question. I, I think even the issue of, um, even the issue of, of kind of the, the QRS timing is kind of interesting in that, that, that narrowing the QRS is clearly associated with response, but there are, you know, there is uh, definitely res uh, positive remodeling in patients who don't have uh, particularly narrow QRSs as well. So I think there's a, a lot to factor in that we don't understand. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna have to drop off. No, thank you. I don't know of any direct comparisons either between QRS um, with versus um, the other parameters that, that we talked about. Um, there's two clinical scenarios that I've I've encountered, they're not related, but I'm curious to see what you think. So one is if you have somebody who has not seen the cardiomyopathy with left lumen bench block and their ejection fraction is not less than 35%, um, but is a clear, very classic left bundle branch. And the question is, could they have uh, left bundle branch induced cardiomyopathy? Um, what, are, what, are, what are the group's thoughts on CRT in these patients? the last part so they are not ischemic and they um... they're, they're not ischemic their ef is less than 50 percent but it's not less than 35 percent um they're uh they have a classic left on the branch block would you consider a crt in these patients to see if it could restore their their lv function and they had no indication for pacing no, no other indication. So yeah, yeah. No, I other, think, no other indication for pacing. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I think you know we've, uh, I've seen in Chris's clinic a couple of patients where we do this in the cardio oncology patient population. So they're non ischemic, um, and they have an EF that's sort of in this borderline range, greater than thirty five but less than fifty, um, and uh, they have. Uh, they're on chemotherapy um, and their EF decreases, but it doesn't decrease to less than 35. Um, and they have a wide, like very typical left bundle. Um, and at least the one patient that uh, I've seen uh, basically was, we, we did a CRTP in her uh, and she had an improvement in her ejection fraction to what was near normal for her, which was her baseline was, in, is, was around 50%. Um, and she was able to get her chemotherapy. So that's the only scenario that I've seen it, but I've seen it, you know, anecdotally, anecdotally improve LV ejection fraction um, in a woman, non-ischemic, large left bundle, which I guess is the population that really should, should benefit from CRT. But, but the thing is in that patient, Christian, is that you know that her drop in EF is related to chemotherapy and that she had to stop chemotherapy. And then that process, like we can point out something like the chemotherapy causing the EF to drop. So if she continues, it's gonna drop further. I feel like that's very different than the non-ischemics that we don't, like they just suddenly have non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and there's no clear cause for it. And their EF is, you know, you, you can't, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, no, I agree. I, mean, I, think, I, I agree with you that it's like, like that a unique, unique situation. It's very unique, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, it sort of begs the question. I like if you had someone with um, a 
um, a um, what's it called? Uh, you know, this intermediate left bundle with a non-ischemic with class three functional symptoms. Could you improve their functional status um, with CRT if you if you got their EF up? I mean, I don't know data, but it does sort of beg the question. Yes, I think there's an entity of left bundle or dyssynchrony induced cardiomyopathy, right? Yeah. But there's no guidelines for, you know, when or which which of those patients, the patient selectors that go into making them good responders for CRT. So that's that's kind of a gray zone. And I um yeah, I I think that that requires more more investigation, but it's it's definitely I think something that could be considered. Um the other kind of non-related um, question that has come up clinically for me personally is when a patient has a, um, uh, or is, is getting cardiac surgery and they will be getting um, an epicardial um, system, at, at what point do you ask the surgeons for a epicardial LV leak? Um, is this something that you can routinely do for everyone, uh, anticipating there might be that many down the road, or how, how would you approach that and thoughts on that? Julie, this was a, a great presentation, and I, I might just come back to where you began with the David trial as to how historically all this really accrued. And the David trial recognized that it was done in an era when dual chamber defibrillators were being placed in heart failure patients. And the thought was most of these patients didn't require pacing, but could you, by pacing these folks, allow more aggressive uh, medical management, increasing their dose of beta blockers, for example, and other medications, and achieve better outcome. And as you know, the outcome was just the opposite. And that is really what created and brought to clinical attention the possibility that RV pacing was detrimental. But it didn't prove that was the fact. And, and it's interesting that the David II trial, which followed on the heels of David I, said, well, Maybe the problem is not um, due to, um, uh, if due to RV pacing, maybe it's due to faster heart rates that we put in these patients to improve their tolerance of heart failure medicine. So in the David II trial, it was an AAI uh, dominated versus no pacing at all. The hypothesis being that the David uh, original hypothesis was correct. If you can pace these folks, you can give them uh, more opportunity for more aggressive heart failure management. But um, if you do it from an a a atrial base and use the normal conduction system, you'll obviate those concerns and still get the best benefit. Uh, results of David too basically said, well, there was no harm in doing AAI pacing. You did not see the decline in ventricular function as was seen with dual chamber pacing in the David trial, but there was no benefit on heart failure either suggesting that simply modifying the heart rate, uh, whether by atrial means or in the case of DDD, um, can either worsen, but doesn't necessarily help ventricular function. Uh, so it's an interesting historical perspective how a trial intended to allow the pushing of drugs more aggressively in heart failure management really turned RV pacing upside down um, and in the, in, as a consequence, led to all these subsequent studies that looked at um, a different modality of pacing entirely. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it is very interesting to how the study intended to do something, at least kind of complete down a different, different route. Um, but I think that there, and it, like with all things, um, it, it really hinges on the right kind of patient selection. Um, to see who would benefit and who wouldn't benefit. Um, CS pacing, I think, ultimately depends on how aggressive one is um, in terms of um, finding the right uh, target branch. Um, and then if there is an opportunity for um, placing the epicardial system, um, I think it should be thoughtfully considered, you know, whether or not to have an epicardial CS LV lead, not a CS and LV lead. Um, but again, I don't know of any studies, any data to, to kind of support or, or um, not support that. Yeah, it, you know, I, I guess it's kind of a uh, corollary to that. I think we have to be careful that our presumption that um, CRT or LB pacing is beneficial in all right. patients 
really has exactly. to be questioned that it's a double-edged sword, just like RV pacing turn, turned to be. And there are clearly subgroups who are worsened by LV pacing. And that's where I don't think one size fits all just because it's LV means now one size fits all. So uh, an important corollary. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for attending and just happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Yes, hi.